Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. Yes, I'm inundated yet again. This is not all of them. I've got another three there. I've got another couple down here. And, well, a whole bunch of them. And, obviously, I won't be able to get through them all today. Sorry about that. Um, but, yeah, hopefully next week. Oh, I've been busy the last couple of weeks for those who've wondered why there's been no mailbag. So, sorry about that. I'll probably go through in the order that I got them. So the oldest ones are first, except for this one down here, which is a brand spanking new product from Fleur. Yes, Fleur just released like yesterday. So we'll probably open that one first. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I have uh, tightened the shot up on this. So I've got the camera uh, closer and sort of down a bit more. People wanted a tighter shot on that. So hopefully this isn't too bad. Let's go. So yes, brand spanking new product from Fleur, and yes, it is a thermal imaging camera. Oh, well, kind of. We'll see. It is brand new. It was released yesterday. It's the 29th here in Australia today. Um, I believe it was re released on like the 27th. Probably should have taken all that crap out. Um, so it is brand spanking. I haven't looked at it yet. Ta-da, here it is. Here we go. Ta-da, it is the Fleur TG165. And um, it's a, it is a thermal camera, but it's more of a uh, visual thermometer kind of thing like uh, uh, Flukes uh, VT02 and VT04 thermal thermometers. It sits in the market between their uh, Fleur 1, of course, for the iPhone, that's all the rage at the moment, uh, in terms of price point and functionality, between that Fleur 1 add-on and or and the Fleur E4 uh, camera that we've looked at. I've got the E8, but the bottom base model E4. So this is $499, bucks, and uh, the only the thing I don't like about it, I haven't even powered it up yet, but I know for a fact it's got the uh, E4 type form factor, which is really quite nice. I love that. And it's rugged and drop proof and everything else. Um, but it doesn't have the MSX technology, and that, that is the difference. I'll post a link down below to a table that Fleur have uh, highlighting the differences between this Fleur 1 for the uh, iPhone and the E4 model. Yes, it does use the new Lepton uh, sensor, same as the Fleur 1, but it doesn't have the camera in it for the um, MSX overlay, which is quite disappointing. But if it did, hey, it'd become a Fleur E4. So they've positioned it between that market, um, it priced about halfway between at 499 but it does have the laser thermometer. So it doesn't read the temperature from the Lepton sensor. It actually reads it based on your traditional uh, laser targeted infrared thermometer. So it's a combination of between a more niche market than either the Fleur 1 or the uh, E4 for a full thermal camera. So it's almost a full thermal camera. It's got that lepton sensor in it, but no, that MSX technology, which is fantastic. So, hmm. And this is what you get in the box, the camera itself, of course, which looks and feels very nice. You get a uh, USB uh, charging adapter with all the requisite adapters, plus a USB cable. But interestingly, the voltage on this thing is 5.35 volts uh, at 2 amps. So it's almost as if they've catered for, like, a, you know, they've presumed that you're going to get a drop in, in the USB cable, which it probably will, um, of course, especially at uh, 2 amps, but still, that's quite unusual to output 5.35 volts. Hmm. So here's where it stands. It is a combination between just your traditional, uh, you know, spot IR uh, laser thermometers like this. The laser is just a targeting uh, based system. So it's got that, but it also overlays a, uh, uses that lepton thermal imaging sensor to overlay the image on there. But it still reads, as I said, the temperature based on your traditional uh, pyroelectric uh, sensor in there. Doesn't get the temperature readout on screen as we'll see from the actual uh, Lepton sensor. And in terms of, you know, size and functionality for it, this is the Fleur uh, E8. 
uh, which is a fantastic thermal camera, but the E4 is exactly the same um, as this. So it, it sits somewhere between there, but it's much smaller, much lighter. Um, it's got an eight hour battery life, rechargeable USB. Yes, it does have a tripod mounting thing on the bottom. Why they couldn't do that on the, um, on the E series, I don't know. Well, because the E series actually uses these nice rechargeable battery packs. This also has a, um, in, in, but it's got an internal rechargeable battery, hence why I guess they could put that, but oh, geez, they should have added it. Real pain in the butt. Anyway, so it sits somewhere between these in terms of uh, price and usability. As I said, no MSX technology like the E series. Now, if you have a look at the front here, you can see we've got dual laser diodes here. I'll show those in operation in a minute so you can actually get the uh, spot difference um, at a distance, which is really uh, quite handy. And then we've got the uh, thermometer window here, which curiously um, isn't your traditional or doesn't seem to have like a traditional Fresnel lens like it does here. So maybe it is inside and that's a, a thermally uh, transparent uh, window. I'm not sure. And then we've got our lepton sensor up here so our lepton devices uh behind that so as and as i said no camera because it doesn't have that camera overlay that msx technology which is so wonderful on the e1 and also um is fairly useful on the fleur one as well and on the top here we've got a usb interface uh for charging i don't know if uh, video comes out of this thing i'm not uh, entirely sure and a little uh, micro sd card there for saving images and no it can't save video all it can do is take uh, screenshots with the trigger down here which also activates the laser and those photos of course are uh, done by the trigger and i'll show you the operation of that and there's our laser warning eh, it's less than a milliwatt she'll be right We've got ourselves a very simplistic interface here as well. I hope it works. The E series is a bit uh, annoying. Let's see how long it takes to boot up. There we go. It's ready to work. No problems at all. It does have an auto uh, shutter on the thing, I believe. So there you go. We can see the uh, image from the lepton sensor, of course. And that, uh, but that measurement spot in the center where it's taking that reading, as I said, not taking it from the lepton sensor. It's taking it from the uh from this window here and your traditional uh pyroelectric infrared sensor so yeah totally different it's a combination of the two so it's really just using the lepton sensor and that image just as a visual guide and then if i press the button like this bingo we can see the uh, dual spots and i'll show you those better in a minute now one thing i found instantly annoying about it is that you press the button down and your uh, lasers come on as you'd expect right to get your uh, window of where it's actually measuring but if you release the trigger here we go if you release it it pops up with an image of that and you can actually you've got a couple of seconds to save that and it's just I find that just a little maybe a bit annoying it would have been nice but I don't know with a single trigger interface maybe you know dedicate one of the buttons on here to actually you know save image or something like that rather than just have to trigger that release it and then bang we can save that and then we can go back in here and go in here and we can go there's our image we've only got one that's it but yeah, I don't know. It's a little bit annoying. Anyway, in terms of our menu interface, it is incredibly simplistic. We can change the uh, color uh, thing there. We have two choices for that. So we can go out of there. There we go. We've got the blue one or the uh, colored one by default. And so nothing fancy there at all. We can set the emissivity, which is fantastic. We can set that in uh, like 0.95 as the default and it looks like we can have a totally custom value in there which is terrific we can increment that to anything we want so that's very nice got a couple of presets that works well and apart from that we can turn our laser off and on when we pull the trigger on the thing and uh, celsius and fahrenheit for you yanks we can turn off the center spot although if you do that it still displays the uh, temperature we can set the timeout and we can set the uh, time and date which is used to um, stamp the files obviously and well that's it that's all she wrote version 1.50 and uh, there's nothing else fancy at all in this thing is designed to be completely idiot proof and that's the advantage of this over like a full thermal camera like this this is the huge advantage and it's more of a niche 
uh, market because it's not a true thermal imaging camera with all the bells and whistles of the E series. You want that, well, you get the E series, which is fantastic. But for those who just want to go out and spot measure a temperature and you traditionally use one of these, well, this one is better. Yeah, it costs you a bit more coin, but it's nice to have the thermal image in there. So if you're going out measuring the temperature of your fuse box or your industrial machinery or something like that, instead of having to m map, you know, using one of these, you have to move it over the whole thing to try and find the hot spot. This one just, you know, you can instantly and easily see the hot spot by virtue of the uh, lepton sensor and the uh, thermal uh, camera in there. So it's worth every cent. But uh, yeah, no MSX technology, but it's just designed to get a ballpark so that you can move the cursor over the hot spot you want to measure and then get it within light, lined up with the lasers and then you take your reading. So it's designed to do one job and one job only. When I first uh, got the specs for this thing, I thought, oh, you know, look, it's, it's, it's quite expensive because it's not as uh, good as the Fleur one in terms of having the MSX technology and the camera, but I can appreciate how, you know, you can't use the Fleur one with your iPhone in some industrial environment and you've got gloves on or you've got whatever. You know, it's a pain in the ass. This thing does a beautiful job, super duper rugged, drop proof to uh, two meters and simple to use, turn it on and it just works. So yeah, but if you want a thermal camera, it's not for you get one of these. Okay, what I've got is my HP power supply here, and if you compare the thermal images of the two, there's just no contest, and you wouldn't expect there to be either. I mean, this one has the 320 by uh, 240 sensor with the MSX technology, so it shows all of the detail, and this one, well, it just shows a few hot spots, but still, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm not using it correctly here. This is not its intended purpose, but I just wanted to show you the difference there. And if we turn off uh, the MSX technology on the E8 there, you can see the difference in the uh, quality of the, uh, you know, the 320 by uh, 240 sensor in the E8 compared to that uh, 80 by 60 lepton sensor there. Huge difference, but, you know, this thing's good enough for just its intended ballpark purpose. Oh, there's that auto power off. Ah, but you can change that, obviously. And of course, if you're trying to measure small details like that hot resistor down there, there's no contest. I mean, the... Uh, the E8 is saying that is, uh, you know, 72, 74, 70, 80 degrees because it can get, it can measure directly the individual pixel uh, on that uh, thermal sensor. But the TG163, sorry, I can't get the glare on the light, you know, because you can see the laser spots there, it is averaging over a bigger area. Uh, like that, you know, it's not, there we go, it's, no, it's not too bad but you've got to muck around and get it because it averages over a larger area you're not going to get fine detail measurements with this thing but that's not what it's designed to do so i'm really you know not using the thing uh within its intended use i just wanted to show you that and i just wanted to show you also how these laser spots change you can see that they're almost vertical like that at that distance in fact i can bring them down and they're vertical at that distance and then they move like that as you get closer and the further away you get the more they spin around like that but basically what it's telling you is that your measurements window is between those two dots so it's basically a circle around those two dots there being the outer limits and if I shined on my door all the way over there bingo you can see that it's uh, moved like that and if I walk towards it here we go i will uh sorry the sound will die i'm not wearing my wireless mic but you'll see it rotate like that there we go Woohoo! So there you have it, that's a brief look at the Fleur TG165, I guess you could call it a visual uh, thermometer, that's the term that Fluke use for their VTO2 and VTO4, and I've tried the Fluke VTO2 and it is 
awful. It really is. I can, if I can, I've got some video footage of that. I might try and include it uh, here. I've got some old footage and yeah, it's truly awful. So compared to that, this thing is absolutely uh, fantastic. It's got a bigger uh, industrial temperature range compared to the Fleur 1, for example, which only has 0 to 100. This does minus 25 to plus 380. Um, and it really is easy to use, rugged. I haven't tried the 2 meter uh, drop test yet but uh yeah it really is um it does the business and super high quality as you'd expect from a floor but possibly a bit pricey at 499 but it's not the consumer market that the floor one was uh trying to target but if you need as i said a real thermal camera go for the e series much better and i guess i can kind of understand not having the msx technology in there because it would really start to compete with this so uh, they've deliberately tried to uh, lower the cost and keep it out there but I would have preferred a cheaper camera there I think you know everything anyone looking for something like that it's a bit pricey but I guess you don't care for those companies who uh, you know need this sort of capability so yeah it's a very nice bit of kit and this doesn't have any video capability like the Fleur 1 either. So it's just, you know, if you want video, you've got to go for the consumer Fleur 1 or the upmarket E-Series. Hi guys, just a quick uh, impromptu video checking out the new Fluke VT-02 thermal camera. And uh, it doesn't look very good, folks. Let's do some uh, practical tests comparing to the um, uh, Fleur i three camera which we've seen before so what we've got is a can filled with uh, hot water there with uh, matte black on it so its emissivity is going to be about uh, 0 0.95 or well, thereabouts and it's only on one half and the emissivity on the other side is of course going to be pretty horrible and let's check out look at the difference in that compared to the uh, Fleur, no contest whatsoever. The uh, Fluke VTO2 is absolute garbage. It really is. It's um, it's like a blob. I have no no idea what sort of sensor or lens they're using in that thing, but it's pretty awful. Look at that. Not impressed at all. Um, the temperature does, if you get it just right, it does seem to work, but uh, it does seem to be reasonably accurate in that respect, but. Otherwise, it's uh, just pretty garbage. Can we turn the camera view on? There we go. So we've got the camera view, and uh, but yeah, it's just a fuzzy blob. Hopeless. Really. No contest whatsoever. And if we do some lights up on the roof here, there's just, ah, oh, man, the fluke is just hopeless. Okay, switch it back to full, look at that, just a blob. So you've got to wonder what lens and sensor they're using in this thing. And there's supposed to be a human in there somewhere. And uh, looks like just a blob on the fluke. Unbelievable. So yes, folks, the Fluke uh, VT-02 looks like it's all marketing. Um, it's really, its performance is probably the worst I've ever seen in a thermal camera. It's just hopeless um jeez I, I don't know one thing i don't like about it either is that the screen is on an angle like this and the sensor is on a different angle so when you're actually pointing it at something you've got to sort of um you know uh, sort of mentally offset the thing whereas the fleur um it you know the screen is you can't really hard to see that but the screen is parallel with the sensor so in use it's um it, this thing's just really annoying to uh, aim at things. I don't like it at all. So anyway, I um, just had a very quick play around with it, but I think that's an absolute fail. So I don't know. <laughs> Thumbs down. Next up, one from Australia. Yes, Charlie Munns. G'day, Charlie. Um, it's got uh, Pooh Bear and Tigger. Awesome. Let's have a look. Make sure I don't cut my mat here. Goodness, oh, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff for Sagan. Look at that, a whole bunch. And we have a note. Let's have a read. 
Well, this one's well worth reading. It's actually from uh, Julie, Charlie's mum. Charlie is a 13-year-old uh, viewer of the EEV blog, and I actually, uh, he contacted me a month or two back, and I actually uh, sent him a one of the Tektronix uh, scopes that I had, because um, he didn't have one. So, anyway, um, uh, Charlie, I had no idea, but uh, Charlie was in, uh, really had some medical problems um, early on, and uh, he's done some uh, fantastic stuff for the Westmead uh, Children's Hospital as ambassador, and in 2012 he completed uh, his commercial uh, ra radio school uh, training. He wants to become a radio broadcaster. Good on you, Charlie. That's awesome. And he's been on uh, 2GB, which is a local uh, radio station here, a couple of times. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And here is a um, Charlie's story and I just wanted to show this look at this this is terrific Charlie celebrates two years since his life-saving liver transplant oh I had no idea Charlie fantastic there he is look at that <laughs> seven weeks old just diagnosed with alpha 1 anti deficiency I can't even pronounce that goodness that doesn't sound good but it sounds like he's doing pretty well these days and Westmead Children's Hospital uh, saved his uh, life with a um, liver uh, a liver transplant. Terrific. I believe you can go on and live a very normal life with a, when, when you have a liver transplant. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, thank you very much, Julie, Charlie's mum, for uh, sending this stuff in for Sagan and Sagan. Westmead Children's Hospital actually saved uh, little Sagan as well. For those following along tweets at home about a year ago or something, he had a pe he got a uh, peanut um, a nut stuck in his uh, lung, airways, and uh, yeah, they had a team of like seven um, surgeons operate on him, and they removed it, no problems whatsoever, so massive thumbs up to Westmead Children's Hospital, one of the best uh, hospitals in the world, thank you very much Charlie and uh, Julie as well, I hope you enjoy the scope, and I hope you have an excellent career, good on you Charlie, two thumbs up. Speaking of medical uh, issues like this, I've got some really good friends whose uh, little boy has uh, congenital muscular dystrophy, a really uh, a massively debilitating disease uh, problem, and they've actually got a possible uh, campaign coming up in two days' time, and I'll link to it at the moment. They've just got a Facebook page, but very shortly um, they'll have that. It's called Beat for Life, and they're trying to raise money for uh, research into this and for drug uh, trials for it, uh, for congenital muscular dystrophy. So please, if you can help out for uh, that research, all the money goes into the uh, research for that um, horrible uh, disease, then please do so. Um, the links will be down below. Very much appreciated. He's a good friend of Little Sagan. Oh, all the fun of sand without the mess. Sounds awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Sagan will love this. Dear Dave, just wanted to thank you for the kindness, time, and oscilloscope you sent. Charlie, you are very kind. We appreciate my random act of kindness, which made Charlie's week a brighter one. No worries. He really loves electronics, had a keen interest way before school even started. That is the best way to go, as did the best electronics professionals I know. Can I offer any advice on post-school education to get into the field? Well, geez, how long have we got? Um, he's already, Charlie's already streets ahead of uh, everyone else, having it for a hobby, having that interest and working on stuff um, outside of uh, the educational uh, system. Given his age, can't do uh, formal education yet, but uh, you know, once that age uh, gets in, that you can start formal education, definitely, but already streets ahead, get involved in uh, possibly public uh, projects, just build, design and build stuff, and I've done videos on uh, job interview uh, tips and things like that, the absolute best thing you can do is bring along stuff you've designed and worked on, because that's what it's all about. And he's already streets ahead, so good on you, Charlie. Next up, we have someone you've seen before, LPRS, Low Power Radio Solutions, the Eric, uh, you know, modules. Um, they uh, have sent something in, they got the, uh, having a second suck of the sav, and they've sent in some, another little wireless Module. Oh, yeah, there we go. Nice to see you again, mate. Here are your Eric modules updated with the latest software. Yes, I've done a video on these before. The um, Eric, there we go, that's Eric. 
He's uh, yes, he's being mended because I broke him um, in a previous video, and these little uh, low-power radio modules are very good. And uh, check them out. I'll link them in down below. I've uh, talked about them in a previous video. They're quite neat. And this is very typical of uh, these sort of modules. And you can see these like half moon uh, castellations here, they're called on the side of the board. And this is an easy way just to uh, either surface mount them on these types of modules onto your PCB, or um, you could actually, uh, you know, uh, use them uh, standoffs, or as we saw in the previous uh, video on these things, you can actually get clips that actually connect in there and these are really easy to do on the board you can see that um, you just do them like as a regular through hole pad and then just define your cut your routing path on your board to go straight through the center of the hole and then you end up with um, yeah my pointer looks really huge on here you end up with this half moon shape with the plating going through the half moon hole there and it uh, really is an easy and simple technique to do that those ones on the side there are a bit messy these ones here a little bit cleaner but uh, yeah quite a common technique castellations next up we have a huge one and it's been here for a while sorry Josh Parker he's from um, Orange in California just orange not Orange County or just orange there you go um in the u.s thank you very much so let's crack this thing open and by the way this mat was pretty tear resistant i did actually um dig into it and scratched it but didn't cut through fantastic uh so let's let's crack into this and let's have a look i think we're gonna like what's in here i think i have an idea of what's in here and it's not an Amazon item, but it does come in an Amazon box. Let's get rid of that. So those foam pellets. And there we go. Let's check it out. We have a note inside, which I'll show you. I'll read in a minute. Oh, goodness. I've got to open it again. Sorry, this could take a while. But... Uh, Oh, there's some, what's a cruddy crap. I don't know what, uh, don't know what that is. Anyway, ugh, ugh, lots of crud, lots of crud, not happy. It's polluting the lab, but ta-da, what we have is an Ampex um, memory 16K memory module. Let's take a look at it. There we go. Huh. Can't see much uh, memory on the top there, but uh, it is two board construction. Mm, let's read the notes, see what we've got here. Friendly greetings, Dave, and to you too. Included is a 16K word ferrite core memory board made by Ampex sometime in the late 70s. Bought a pair of them off eBay. According to the seller, they are unused spares for the NASA ESA uh, Myrta 125 Space Lab ground computers during the early parts of the Space Shuttle program. Fantastic. Apparently, it's an 18-bit memory configuration with 16-bit word plus one parity bit plus one protection bit which you work out over a quarter of a million ferrite cores. Goodness sake, where are they hidden? Um, haven't been able to find much info, but it seems to have been on a fast, larger module of the more common Mitra 115. Uh, Ampex, mostly known for the magnetic storage products, and I haven't been able to find many details. Um, a bits of history too good to pass up. I just had to share one with you and other viewers. Thank you very much. And yes, you left it sealed in the original packing engine it's been at since 1993. Hence all the crust. It could be like... Um, mouse poo or something like that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh. This is awesome. And uh, there's some links down below, which I'll include. And here we go. Mitro 125S, okay, for space. Uh, well, this would have been in uh, one of the journals uh, back in the day, an ad in one of the uh, electronics or computer magazines, I guess. And uh, there you go. Can't read that, of course, but uh, I think he sent me a... Um, email copy of this i'll include it if i can check it out it's all uh very well i'm not going to say boring because it's in it's still uh nice in its own right um uh, here but we want to of course see the ferrite core memory unfortunately it looks like there i'm gonna have to undo it all it's a two board 
construction here and I can't see any ferrite core memory obviously it's in the it's in the center here on the lower board and this is all the driver stuff which uh, goes along with it all dip technology of course let's see if we can get a date code on one of these 32nd week 1975 so there you go there's some more more uh, 74 date code uh, stuff down here and uh, yeah all uh, TI parts 7442s for example and uh, yeah probably other stuff that we can get uh, get data on but we've got a whole bunch of drivers and things along here and there's some interesting things to note actually look at this inside here you'll see that Look at those under there that run the whole length of these chips. These were very common back in the day. These are actually decoupling caps that run under the chips and then go down into the same holes as the chip. So you put the big decoupling cap on first and then you through the holes and then you put the... Um, they're, they're actually... Um, they would be totally custom made for the particular pitch between the chips in here and then inserted into the particular uh, power pin holes you used to be able to get uh, generic ones maybe you still can um, that go into dip packages like this and they'll have you know one pin over here and one pin over here for power and um, uh, power and uh, ground for example but this would have been custom made and it's a bulk bulk decoupling cap for all of these chips here and likewise right on the edge of the board look at this it is a bulk decoupling cap you can see the you see the pins down in here it's a bulk decoupling cap that runs the entire length of the board look at that absolutely fantastic and then we got some horrible dip tantalums here look color coded ah oh, beautiful those were the days but uh, and then they've got them running right up the length of these chips as well so it's um if you have a look at that there you go they got them running all over the shop. I mean, this thing would have only been working at a couple of megahertz, I guess. But, you know, you've got to have some decoupling on there. And that bulk decoupling is a way to do that on probably, I, I would assume, maybe a double-sided board. And, yep, it is a double-sided board. I can actually see uh, through there if you hold it up to the light. And just uh, regular tin plate on the bottom. There's no uh, solder mask or no overlay or anything on the bottom side so this is the board we need to screw out which will have the memory on it because uh, there's nothing on the top here but we should be able to unscrew that pretty easily and uh, it's a really fascinating board mix of technology are they resistor arrays they've got there their resistor networks I'm assuming um, so yeah interesting mix you'll notice the uh, turrets the through so they've got the pin sticking up bit of corrosion on that bottom board uh, the pin sticking up and then into the turrets mounted on the top board so that's how they join the two boards together and uh, absolutely fascinating board I like this one and I'll tell you what this really took some prizing apart there's a lot of force that goes into that and ta-da uh -huh, we're robbed we still can't see it We've got some more drivers on here, and see there's nothing on the bottom, just all the tin plate. And uh, got some more drivers around here, but this is where the 16K core memory will be hidden. Ah, oh, let's get this off. And for those playing along at home, there's the sticker. It's the model 1600, serial number 2673, and it needs 5 volt and 15 volt uh, supplies. So, yeah, I can probably still power this thing up, if we could even get schematics for it. I doubt it. And of course, we've had some ferrite core memory on here before, and uh, I've shown that, and it really is sexy, old school technology. And uh, no, I still need to get that one there off. And well, I suspect the warranty is not valid anymore from the mid 70s. So screw that warranty, and uh, let's get into it. Oi, we're in. Oh, in like Flint. Look at that. Look at the density on that that is just incredible i can't zoom in enough oh and if you thought my previous one was tiny look you can still just see the ferrite rings in there if you are viewing this in hd most likely but compare that with this one and holy crap macro lens time oh wow look at that that is stunning look at the density of those the ferrite rings 
That is absolutely incredible. Sorry, I can't really, can't get a huge amount better than that, but that is just, wow. Unbelievable. Look at all those ferrite rings. Each ferrite ring, of course, stores one bit of data in the uh, magnetic field, and it probably, I don't know, could still have data on it these days if we could figure out how to read the bastard out. So that is just utter madness. That is incredible. Oh my goodness, sorry, my macro lens isn't good enough. As you can see, the uh, uh, distortion of the lens and the uh, brocade around the outside, it just, just isn't good enough to really capture this sort of detail. It's absolutely incredible. Check out these just massive buses of this enamel coated, very fine enamel coated wire go into wired into individual uh, pads like that which then go into these big dip chips it's just and they just branch off like that as we go down it just gets thinner 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 until well there's a few branching out like that and oh, oh we couldn't fit that on the board so we're just branching these off down here it's just oh, it's insane and then you've just got the bundles of multicolored enamel coated wire doing the rows and columns in then in there and it's and of course the uh, sense line and the inhibit line it's just uh, I don't even want to know how they manufacture this thing well actually I do because it'd be totally fascinating but like it, this is rocket science and there you go I'm shooting that from near vertical with my times 10 macro lens and almost the full I think I am yet the full uh, 20 times optical zoom on my Canon HFG 30 plus the times 10 macro lens and that is just ridiculous what is the dimensions down in there let me get a ruler and I'm a little bit annoyed that I can't find my really fine graticule uh, measurement microscope uh, marker but here's a steel ruler with half millimeter increments there and well there's at least two of those per half millimeter uh, spacing that's just crazy so there's an attempt to measure it with my micro ruler there and well each little ferrite rings about roughly just maybe just under half a millimeter diameter actually they're not a huge amount smaller than the existing ferrite rings that I had on the previous one I showed it's just really essentially just the density that they're able to uh, you know thread these things with I mean it's got to be I don't know, at least 10 times the density in this thing compared to the old board just look at that there's no comparison in the density of that so you know let, let's call it by almost the same size uh, ferrite ring slightly smaller but that that density they overlap each other in the in the horizontal direction there crazy but of course you're not going to get any interaction between the ferrite cores because it's the wire actually running through it and the fact that it's a ferrite ring and the magnetics of how that works you don't actually get any interference to from the uh, ferrites next to it so it works a treat so you can basically uh, as long as you got the wires actually physically going through them you can pretty much um, you know pack them as dense as you want there so thank you very much Josh for sending in that marvelous piece of uh, space shuttle, early space shuttle, late 70s uh, vintage computer technology and we love ferrite core rope memory like this, it's just fantastic. I showed off uh, my previous one at the electronics uh, trade show and it was a huge hit. But like I had the Tagano microscope there and people really, uh, you know, lusted after that. That was double-sided technology by the way. Uh, this one didn't need it because of the incredible density in this thing 16k i don't know if that's 16k bytes or 16k bits hmm anyway thank you very much this is just awesome it's a feature piece for sure frameable